Hello, Peter Muskos. This is Glenn Lowry. Uh, hi, how are you doing? I'm good, Glenn. I uh, just want our audience to know that this is another edition of The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, hosted by yours truly, Glenn Lowry, and I am very pleased today to have as my guest Professor Peter Moscos, uh, who's a sociologist uh, teaching at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the City University of New York. So uh, welcome, Peter. Thanks. It's good to talk to you, Glenn. It is indeed good to be talking to you, Peter Moscos, author of the book Cop in the Hood, which recounts his days working as a police officer in Baltimore, a sociologist by training and uh, teaching at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and uh, an interesting uh, commentator on the contemporary events about race, policing, uh, and um, urban America. And so, Peter, I wanted to chat with you about all that I've been reading in the newspaper and seeing uh, on cable television and so forth, the controversies emerging from uh, Michael Brown and Darren Wilson, the uh, young black man and police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, the controversies uh, surrounding um, the uh, case in Baltimore that uh, led to significant civil unrest where uh, police officers have been indicted for uh, serious crimes in their treatment of, uh, I'm sorry, I forget his name already. Freddie Gray. Thank you very much. Freddie Gray, uh, who died uh, as a consequence of injuries he incurred while being taken into custody by Baltimore police. Uh, New York City, which has been the site of significant political turmoil around policing issues with Mayor de Blasio's determination to end the stop and frisk policy, meeting with resistance on many from many quarters and with uh, two police officers having been assassinated there by an individual who seemed to have been motivated in part by an animus, a racially inspired animus toward the police and so on. So we have we have now a significant moment, do we not, in uh, the history of urban policing in the United States, a moment that many people see as an opportunity for change. Um, and we have controversy. And you're the expert, so I don't want to take too much time trying to, to summarize the lay of the land. But I'm interested both in what you see uh, to be the nature of this uh of this controversy, the problems, uh, and uh, how you react to uh, some of the strong positions that people have taken on both sides of, of this debate about uh, the uh, relationship between uh, law enforcement officers and uh, communities of color in America's big cities. There's certainly been a greater polarization, which um, is unfortunate because I think we do need to find, find a middle ground. Um, and, and, at this moment, no, I'm not really optimistic that we're moving to that. But there is a certain opportunity here, given the crises that have happened, and just the focus on police, and to a lesser extent, the focus on, on crime that I think we should be more focused on, because these are important issues. But we're going to have to see what comes up with this. I mean, I think part of the problem, <clears throat> part of the problem is simply um, lumping all those cases together. I, I think there are big differences. Um, I also think there's a problem of trying to find moral justice in individual criminal prosecutions. Our, our justice system is, does not work that way. Um, and there may be greater moral issues um, even if individual police officers aren't criminally responsible. Um, but the public, I think, in general sort of thinks that the only justice can be found from the criminal conviction of one person. And that's not our way our system works. Um, a lot of cops get off because they may have done instances of bad policing, but it's not criminal policing. Um, and if we want moral justice in this country, and I think we should be working towards a more moral and just society, um, to some extent, I think we're barking up the wrong tree by focusing almost exclusively on, on real and perceived police misconduct. Well, that's a mouthful, Peter. You use the word crime, and that word is uh, anathema to some participants in this debate who think that, you know, it's a dodge from uh, issues of civil rights and uh, police abuse. You talk about crime, of course, there's crime. These are disadvantaged communities. People are hard pressed. Uh, it's not new that at the bottom of society, you have higher crime rates, but the uh, police officers are agents of the state. And when they misstep, uh, it's a different matter altogether. So some people would object to mixing a concern about crime with a concern about uh, you know, not having unarmed black men, whether they be criminal or not, shot in the back as they uh, flee away from a police officer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, there, and I understand those objections. I think a crime is worse when committed by 
a police officer because he or she is an agent of the state because they're supposed to enforce the law. Um, but I also think there's a question of priorities and triage. Uh, really, it's more a triage issue in certain communities when you have neighborhoods like the one I policed in Baltimore, where literally more than 10% of men are murdered in their lifetime. Um, I, I, I think <laughs> that that's a far greater moral harm. And now, you know, it would be nice if we could pat our heads and rub our bellies at the same time and deal with both these issues. Um, but I, frankly, I'm just more worried about where the, where the greater amount of carnage is. Let me just be clear. You have just asserted that in the neighborhoods where you, some years ago, while a graduate student at Harvard working on a dissertation about policing and embedded, I suppose would be the word. Well, with, I would say working. I mean, I was a cop. Okay. He was a cop. You went through the training. You were a, a legitimate member of the police force working there and observing. You're asserting that 10 percent of the men in the communities where you were working as a police officer were going to be killed uh, uh, sometime during their but before <laughs> before they could die from natural causes, as it were. I think it was before they hit the age of 35 or 40, even. But if you make it that far without being murdered, the odds are you're going to you, you're going to make it. I, I think the number is 13 percent. Um, the math is in my book, Cop in the Hood, um, and that doesn't take into account the people who aren't in the game. You know, there are some people even in violent neighborhoods who are at very low risk. Um, I mean, you can, you, you can and perhaps should argue no one deserves to get murdered, but even in a place like Baltimore, there are not too many innocent victims. And by innocent, I mean someone who was not committing a crime when they got murdered or even does not necessarily know their offender. I mean, the idea of a, you know, a stranger minding his own business who gets robbed and killed, that, that's rare even in Baltimore. Um, but so, yeah, 13% of men... Um, are getting killed. And so, and you know, that doesn't include the ones who shot and, and, and live. Um, that I think is the, that's what we got to be focusing on. Um, Baltimore's got a lot, a lot, a lot of problems and, um, I don't think police are number one, but yeah, like you said before, look, if you see police as agents of racial repression, and if you see that police have little, if any impact on crime, um, which is might sound crazy to a lot of people, but there's a lot of I mean, that's the traditional root causes argument in academia, that society causes crime. Um, and so the police job is to arrest offenders. And that was the standard police uh, model from the late 60s into the 70s and 80s. Um, if you buy all that, then you want police doing less. You don't want cops to have discretion. You don't want them being proactive. Because according to this line of thought, a proactive cop has more chances to be brutal and racist. Well, what we've seen in Baltimore since the riots, since April 27th, um, is that shootings and homicides have more than doubled, literally overnight. Um, and that's both compared to last year at the same time. But it's that literally overnight part that we've never seen, as far as I know, ever in any city, period, for violence and murder to go up by such an extreme amount um, just from one day to the next. And it stayed there now. You know, we're doing this and... and close to the middle of June. So, you know, we're, we, we've got now a lot of days and there are a lot more dead people in Baltimore now. Okay, let me, let me just interrupt for a minute here because I think this is fundamentally important. Most people listening to this conversation will be familiar with this, uh, you know, talking heads debate that goes on on cable TV, Fox News, MSNBC, and so forth, about whether the uh, spike in um, uh, violent crime in uh, Baltimore and other places is related to uh, police behavior. Uh, Charles Blow, the columnist, uh, African-American writer at the New York Times op-ed page, has recently, uh, you must have seen it, uh, addressed this question and said, in effect, if I uh, recall him correctly, that it's a canard. It's a canard to say that uh, the uh, protest against and the holding accountable for their transgressions and protest against those transgressions that have come from the Black Lives Matter movement over and against the uh, police uh, in these cities, a canard to say that those protesters are somehow responsible for this spike in homicide. And yet and I understand... Yes, the protesters ahead. aren't responsible for the Very spike good. in homicide. Um, the rioters are, did things that led to the, the increase in homicide. I think the leadership, the mayor of Baltimore and the police commissioner of Baltimore, um, they're partly responsible um, because policing matters. Policing has changed. So yes, you could argue police to some extent are responsible because of what they're not doing. Um, but I would never say the protesters are responsible for the increase in crime. Um, and to some extent, I think Blow was sort of building up a straw man by, by presenting that argument. What I am saying is that 
police matter, and that is it should be common sense. Look, there there is simply no other theory um, explaining the overnight doubling, more than doubling of of, of shooting in Baltimore. Um, poverty didn't suddenly get worse. Um, any other factor? I mean, what changed what changed are, are criminals, and, and and what changed is policing. Um, now that might be different, and you know, I'm I'm not talking about New York City now. Um, different cities may have different issues going on, uh, but certainly the increase in crime in Baltimore um, is related to policing. I mean, you know, it's interesting for people who want to discount policing is they never talk to cops. I mean, there, there, there are mechanisms here that have led to more people shooting each other. Um, primarily, it is that cops are not being proactive. Uh, the numbers are way down in the police force. Um, about 100 officers also were injured during the riots. Um, and then you have a situation where uh, before, in Baltimore, traditionally, you, you police solo. You don't have a partner. Um, so you get a call and you'd handle it. I'm not saying that would solve the problem, but you'd handle it. And I've had police officers tell me um, in the Western District that now where before one officer could handle a call, you do need two, three, or four officers um, because of crowds that developed um, basically every time they stepped out of their car. So officers were not being proactive. They were not frisking people. They weren't going hands-on, and they weren't making discretionary arrests because, quite frankly, um, they didn't want to start another problem. And they didn't want to feel that if they made a, if they did start a problem, they were afraid that the department would blame them for it. Um, there's a cliche in, in the that I'm familiar with, you know, in the police world, that if you don't work, you can't get in trouble. Um, but what's going on in Baltimore is not a coordinated slowdown. They're trying to do their job. They're simply not able to police in the way they policed before. And look, the long-term solution to Baltimore's problems, um, I don't think, is clearing drug corners. Um, I think we have to end the war on drugs. Um, I think we have to invest money and, and empathy into communities that need it. Um, those things certainly matter. But my focus is on policing, so that's what I look at. And okay. if you can postpone... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, please. If you can postpone a homicide by just breaking up one of the steps that leads to it, um, and that could be a lot of people gathering on a corner and then a fight develops, you know. Um, it could be the fact that a person has a gun on them rather than near them, and when someone starts shooting, they can shoot back and someone can die. It could be someone's trying to get someone and they can't find them on the corner because police just cleared the corner, and, you know, the person then goes back and talks to his girlfriend who talks him out of it. Um, this is, none of these are foolproof, but they all are steps that lead to homicide, and a homicide postponed can be a homicide prevented, and, and um, in the short term, perhaps you need that more aggressive form of policing. Um, look, I'm open to other suggestions, uh, but to, to ignore what is going on in Baltimore, the increase in crime, or to say that it's not because of policing, um, I, I, I think is, is, to put your head in the sand on something that's so important, something that's so lethal, I, I just think it's inexcusable. Very good. Let me press a little bit here. Policing matters. Uh, that's what you say. And police are not being permitted to be proactive. Now, I'm at Brown University, uh, Professor, and when the commissioner of police at that time, Ray Kelly, uh, this would have been October of 2013, came to Brown uh, to give a lecture, the title of the lecture that he had announced was Proactive Policing. That lecture was met by fierce pushback. Indeed, he was not permitted to speak. At the end of the day, he was shouted down after maybe 30 minutes of trying to begin his address by groups of people chanting, uh, no justice, no peace, no racist police, who declared that proactive policing was the modern day equivalent of Jim Crow racism, okay? who objected to stop and frisk policing, stop, question, and frisk as being both unconstitutional, a federal judge had held to that effect, and also uh, racially discriminatory in the extreme, as many innocent people were being detained. They have rights too. Believe me, in some precincts, the very idea of proactive policing is, you know, it's equivalent to racism. So what do you have to say to those people about the majority of the individuals who will be detained or questioned under a proactive policing policy who are not about to shoot their neighbor and are not carrying any weapons. Stop and frisk was overused in New York. I think they're right about that. Um, you know, it depends. My, my police officer friends think I'm some, you know, card-carrying pinko communist, and my <laughs> academic friends think I'm some fascist conservative cop. I don't think either of them are right. Um, 
yeah, I, I'm not going to defend stop and frisk the way it was done in New York. It was done too often. It was done in a zero tolerance approach, which is not, I think it's important to emphasize, is not broken windows policing. Um, in Baltimore, when I was there, uh, there were 100,000 arrests a year. This is a city of, you know, just over 600,000 people. In the Eastern District, where I police, there were t over 20,000 arrests and 45,000 residents. Um, at some point, you just got to go, that's too many. Um, now, I also heard people say, oh, the, the, the riots happened in Baltimore because there were too many arrests. Well, arrests have dropped by 65% in Baltimore. So why didn't they happen back in 2003? Look, you can say that there's racism in America. There is. You can say there's racism in our criminal justice system. There is. Um, but we could replace every white cop with an African-American officer, and we wouldn't solve these police issues because at its core, I don't think it is about police racism. I think it's about class, um, something we're almost never willing to discuss. Um, but these are class issues in America. Um, it's not a war on African-Americans, um, but there is a level of repression and containment that's going on in America's ghettos. Um, some of that is structural inherent racism. Some of that is people not knowing what else to do um, in certain neighborhoods where 10% of men are getting murdered in their lifetime, lifetimes. Um, these are issues we're, we're afraid to talk about. Part of what's so bad about shouting down someone like Ray Kelly, and I was never a huge Ray Kelly fan, um, but we need to talk about these issues and let him say what he's going to say and then, you know, talk about it. But yeah, if you think cops are the enemy, I respectfully disagree, but you're not being a constructive part of the debate. Um, so, I, you know, do what you got to do, but I'm going to keep talking about how to, um, how to improve policing. I was sitting in the front row uh, in a List Auditorium at Brown University in October of 2013 when Ray Kelly was shouted down. And I could hear him mumbling through his first couple of sentences, which were, I could hear him over the shouting because I was sitting right in front, uh, which were, I just left a meeting with black residents of, and I don't know what he was going to say, but I assume they were people who were thanking him <laughs> for proactive policing or they were victims of uh, uh, some uh, criminal offense who wished that there had been more proactive policing to protect them uh, from uh, what had happened. And I, I deeply regretted that that consideration never got placed alongside of the legitimate concerns about people's civil rights and about the uh, over excessive use of the tactic. You, but we, you know but we, we, we never had that debate. What frustrates so many police officers is a lot of them feel um, that they're the only ones who actually do care about black lives. Look, the first shooting I handled, I was still in field training, um, and the victim wouldn't tell me his name. Um, he said, no, nah, I don't play that game. And I asked him what game exactly that he wasn't playing. Anyway, I was able to get his name out of him, but of course, um, the shooter wasn't convicted because the victim knew who shot him, he knew why he was shot him, and he didn't want to deal with police for whatever reason he had. Um, so police feel, who spend the majority, uh, many officers spend the majority of their professional lives trying to stop black violence, trying to fig trying to trying to prevent it, trying to arrest offenders. Um, and they look at a society that doesn't seem to give a damn um, because it's not on the evening news. Um, and then to, for them to be called called the problem, it just it, it puts them, you know, yeah, protesters can care about black lives and also care about police abuses, but it would be nice to see some of this focus. I must just said it's a matter of priorities. Um, I, I, black violence, um, American violence, not just black violence, but you okay. know, the black homicide rate is what six times higher per capita than the white homicide rate. Um, this is this is a national crisis, um, and and so to shout the police down um, and say that you, look, no, even you might hate the police, but you're not going to win that debate in society. You're not going to win it in elections. Police are here to stay. So then we got to say, okay, let's make police part of the solution. Um, and I don't see that constructive side of the debate so much. And th there's some exceptions, of course. But what you're, you know, w but look, there's always going to be idiotic people in colleges against free speech. Um, we don't have to encourage that. But you know, then you move on and. Well, you but let them. me let me ask you this. Okay, so New York City. My understanding is that you had in the early 1970s, at the peak of the homicide epidemic, if you will, over 2,000 homicides uh, in a year in the early 70s in New York. And that that's well, down. Well, homicides peaked in ninety uh, in ninety one, ninety two. Okay, at at a rate over two thousand per year. Yeah, yeah, they were also, they were also high in that area you're talking about, but the more recent and I think the higher peak was um, I think ninety one though I might be off by a year. Okay, early nineteen nineties peak, 
over 2,000 homicides a year. That number now is down to under 400 in the most recent year. Uh, that's a remarkable reduction in the homicide rate. Now, most of the victims of homicide in New York City would have been young men of color, I'm guessing. Would you confirm that? Yes, the vast majority. Okay, so we're talking about maybe 1,500 to 1,700, quote, lives saved, close quote, in the sense of a reduced homicide rate the vast majority of which would have been uh, black and brown young men. Uh, that's quite a few black lives. Uh, you're crediting the police for that. Not for all of it, but for, yeah, a large part of it, absolutely. Um, police got back in the crime prevention game under, the, under when Bill Bratton took over the department. You know, he started in transit, then went to Boston, then came back to New York. Um, and advocated a broken windows philosophy, which is not zero tolerance policing. Um, I think Ray Kelly turned that on his head a bit. Um, so I think that's why I said I, simp I agree with a lot of the critics of Ray Kelly. Um, the, the, a lot of those stop and frisks uh, were completely unnecessary, and we stopped them. Um, and we stopped them, and though there's a little uptick now, um, you know, the sky is not falling in New York. Um, but what, what, what the NYPD changed, um, and you know what, crime did not go down everywhere. Um, not at the level we saw in New York, not at the magnitude we saw in New York. Because um, often you hear that, well, crime would, like somehow God Almighty above ordained it that that crime would start dropping in 92. Um, I simply don't buy that. Um, I don't think police are the only reason. And immigration, um, and in New York City, immigration played a large factor. Um, I also like to point out that New York City locked up fewer people over the two decades that um, since then. Uh, so it's not that we simply locked up all the criminals, certainly not the case in New York, um, but simply the idea that cops matter, simply the idea that they should arrest. And remember, I'm, I'm saying this as someone who thinks we should legalize drugs, but um, patrol cops were not permitted to make drug arrests until Bratton took over the department. Um, someone smoking a joint in front of the cop, look, I don't think it should be a crime, but if it is a crime, certainly um, I don't think cops should ignore crimes that happen right in front of them. So... What cops say is, look, he let police be police again, but they suddenly got back in the crime prevention game. Um, it had a huge and immediate impact on crime in New York. Um, yeah, there are other factors, but crime went down more here, um, and that decreased. It's also, you know, in hindsight, it's easy to say, oh, well, there are other factors, and there were. Um, there wasn't a single professor in any university who accepted, acknowledged, or predicted the crime drop uh, that was going to happen. The entire field of criminology and sociology was wrong. Um, this is why I went into it. I started grad school in 95. At that point, murders were down 30 40%. And I said, my God, if everyone's wrong, um, this is probably a pretty good field to get into. Um, <laughs> and, and your conclusion from that study is that uh, changes in police practice and behavior were substantially responsible for that reduction? Changes in police behavior, changes in police focus. Um, yeah. George Kelling, one of the authors of Broken Windows, said the real accomplishment of Broken Windows is simply we, we, it, it gave police the excuse to deal with um, things the public wanted them dealing with all along, which were quality of life issues and order maintenance. Um, while I think society should maybe better triage its problems, um, I don't think police should triage all its problems. They do have to focus um, on the little things, uh, the little things that matter. The little things that cause public fear. This is not giving tickets for the sake of giving tickets. This is not arresting people for the sake of productivity. Um, and this was happened. This happens in a lot of cities. This is a problem. This is what we have to fight back against. Um, but to give police officers the discretion to the, the freedom and discretion to know their neighborhood and understand what the problems are. You know, we have to treat cops like professionals, um, and then by and large, they will act like professionals. Um, part of what worries me about the police protests, and to a certain extent the defensiveness of police in response, is, is some of it, in a way, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if the police go, ah, if the public doesn't like us, fuck them. Um, that's, <laughs> not, that's not healthy for everyone, um, for anyone. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you're putting a lot of stress on the distinction between quality of life policing, broken windows, and stop and frisk. And you're stressing that cops got back into the crime prevention business, which I'm interpreting, correct me if I'm wrong to be, they began to give their attention, knowing the community and observing what's going on on the streets, to small offenses and addressing them so as to head off the development of behaviors that might lead to bigger offenses. Uh, but this is a crude uh, uh, report from me. I want to hear what a precise characterization of the circumstance would be. Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of gray. Um, there is uncivil behavior that 
should be the focus of police attention um, that isn't necessarily criminal. Um, you know, guys sitting on the stoop harassing women who walk by. Yeah. I don't know what you'd actually arrest the person for. Um, it would be a tough arrest. Uh, I don't know if cat calls are illegal, but they're not civil. Um, that's something where police can do it. If, 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 people, if people are afraid, fear is one of the key variables of a broken windows approach. What makes a reasonable, not a crazy person, what makes a reasonable person afraid? Um, there's a certain reality to urban life that people who live in cities know. Um, and certain, you know, behaviors are acceptable and certain aren't. But, and you need, you need to encourage cops to, to understand what makes the city tick and then to, to act on it. I mean, it all, you know, Broken Windows very much is based on um, Jane Jacobs' theory of urban life. If you want to understand Broken Windows, you should really go back to her Death and Life of Great American Cities because that's what it's based on. Um, so you need that kind of policing. Now, it's also you can understand proactive policing by simply the opposite which is you wait for someone to call the cops and then you respond. Usually it's after the fact. Um, the problem with that system is it takes about half the police department. It sucks resources. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of people shouldn't get a police response when they call police. The public doesn't think the cops are always answering calls that matter, calls where police need to be there, calls where a crime is committed. Um, but if we promise unlimited police supply, um, which we can't deliver. Uh, there are a lot of people who just, some people don't call cops enough and other people call them way too much um, for things that are, are have no business of, of, of police. You know, my daughter won't go to school. I think every cop has gotten that call. Why, why would you call police for that? But cops got to respond. And that's a moment. So the pressure, though, is to remain available to answer calls for service. Um, when really the pressure should be get out of your car and, and interact with people, um, both non-criminals and criminals. Um, part of the problem, though, I also think with, with a lot of the recent uh, opposition to police is uh, I don't want to say too much focus on community relations because community relations are important. Um, I don't know if you can have too much focus on that, but that's only part of the equation. Non-criminals should not hate the police, and if they do, that's, you know maybe the police are doing something wrong. Um, but in, you know the working people, the good people... Um, even some of the people who, okay, you know, some of them small time hustlers, that's not, that's one thing. But I think a lot of opponents of police forget the police have to deal with a lot of hardcore criminals and it's too easy to tell cops what not to do. Um, you know, don't be racist, don't kill people, uh, you know, don't show, shoot people for no reason. Those are all fair. Okay. We can, we can say that, but what's lacking is what do we want cops to do? So we put, you know, these working class individuals, men and women, black and white and all races, and we put them in situations without really telling them what they're supposed to do. And so the recent events, um, and you have situations like Ferguson, uh, and we still don't know what happened in Baltimore with Freddie Gray. Um, but in Ferguson, according to the Department of Justice, and I know there are different ways you can read it, but that report, um, in so many words, said that, that was a perfectly legitimate shooting because the officer was attacked. So you have this whole narrative um, of the racist repressive police and a lot of the facts don't back that up. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any other way to read the Justice Department report on the Darren Wilson, uh, Michael Brown encounter than... No, people try, it, but I don't think they've read the whole thing. I mean, it is so... And I don't think his it, goal was to let the officer off, but my God, if you... I mean, you know, if you're going to say, no, I still think he had his hands up or all it did was say that he shouldn't be charged, read the whole damn report. Because um, yeah. it, it's got... It's powerful. Now, that said... I don't know how we would know about the other, the greater, what I think are greater issues of racism and injustice in Ferguson, Missouri, and other small towns like that. Yeah. Um, but again, why can't we talk about this before someone gets killed by the cops? Um, and okay. then why, and then, and then but, let's also be reasonable to the police officer involved if they didn't do anything wrong. Look, part of the thing now with Freddie Gray in Baltimore is um, we, at this, what I'm saying is I still don't know what happened to Freddie Gray. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'd like to know. I don't. Now, even if one of the cops killed them maliciously, which I'm not saying is a given, and I, I, I don't... Yeah. Even if that's true, I guarantee you that those six officers who are charged are not all guilty. Um, so the idea of sort of rounding up everyone who was there because they were there and criminally charging them, um, that's what's made it... That's what had a, had a chilling effect on proactive policing in Baltimore um, because the cops are going, well, I could have been there, and now I'd be criminally charged? Yeah. These cops were working at 8.45 on a Sunday morning. Yeah. You know, 
I got a secret. I wasn't working at 845 on a Sunday morning. Um, that's where that was quiet time in policing, even in Baltimore. Um, they did not go to work wanting to do bad. You know, they were focusing on that corner because it was a problem, a problem specifically stated, ironically, by the state's attorney, the same one prosecuting them now. Um, but again, we're not, it's, cops aren't going to win the war on drugs and we make them fight it. And then you get collateral damage and then we blame cops. And I, I just think that's un, unfair to the, to both the citizens and the police. Good, good, good. Now I want to push back a little bit, Peter, uh, on the social science front. I want to ask you how you know that uh, proactive policing or quality of life policing is responsible for the reduction in violence. Uh, many cities are uh, observing and enjoying a peace dividend. Not all of them have used the same police tactics. Am I unaware of studies that have definitively demonstrated the causal connection between uh, quality of life policing on the one hand and reduced levels of violence? Because I thought that this was still an open question research wise. Well, it's still an open question. Yeah, I think you might be on from there is research that definitely supports um, the idea linking order maintenance um, with fewer calls for service with community satisfaction. Um, it's just a, it's an ideological divide in academia. To, and it's people who, yeah, who most, you know, from, from, from the lefter side of the already pretty far left spectrum. Um, yeah say that, you know, I've said, said that cops, that crime could never go down until we addressed root causes. Um, and there are some very smart uh, professors, you know, who are friends of mine who wrote this and still believe it. Um, you know, it'll, we'll, we're never going to prove definitively anything in social sciences. That's part of the problem. But when you have so much circumstantial evidence, yeah. um, you know, some people are always going to dismiss it. Um, but let's also not forget that what started in New York spreads very quickly. Um, Sim and this sounds so obvious now, and it led to some of the uh, abuses in New York City as well, but simply keeping track of crime statistics, CompStat in New York, yep. um, that really wasn't done before. Now, that isn't rocket science. Um, that spread very quickly. Uh, one thing that has, I think, definitively been proven work uh, that works in policing is hotspots policing. Put cops where the crime is. Um, it does have a deterrent effect. Um, but if you don't know where the crime is happening, except on anecdotal evidence, you couldn't do that. Um, now, the problem where Comstat went a little haywire, particularly under Kelly, is it, it did become, despite uh, urging from the brass saying it's not a numbers game, when it went down through the idiotic chain of command of policing, yeah. um, it became a numbers game. Um, and it became about producing stats for their own sake. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think when, when, when police departments, the countrywide, very quickly said, oh, let's figure out where crime is happening, let's find patterns... Um, you know, what do you know? You find a lot of patterns are stolen cars um, at 3.30 p.m. between high school and, you know, and subway and bus stops. Well, you can figure out, okay, it's kids getting out of school committing crimes. Um, that data suddenly made it clear, even if you suspected that all along, but it allowed you to shift resources there. So that didn't just happen in New York City. And that's not necessarily broken windows policing I'm talking about. So there were other factors here. Um, but that, that's, a, that's one of them, is simply keeping accurate and timely account of crime. Um, look, if there was one factor that had nothing to do with police that I think may have had an influence, um, uh, I think getting lead out of the environment, um, the correlation is pretty perfect. It also explains why crime didn't go down very much in Baltimore, because Baltimore still got a lead paint problem. Um, but that may have had something to do with it, because that happened in the mid-70s, that group is coming or a bit later. That group is coming into its sort of prime crime age. Uh, just so me, you know, may, maybe lead has a major factor. That's got nothing to do with cops. Uh, but certainly um, the difference that you see in crime reduction in cities, you know, if, if it was all, if it were, if it were factors that had nothing to do with police, why didn't crime go down in Baltimore or why didn't it go down very much? Um, I don't hear any other theories to this. Okay. Let, uh, got it. A uh, good reason for us to think, maybe somewhat circumstantial, but there's a ton of evidence to the effect of a positive relationship between uh, certain kinds of policing practices, let's call them proactive, and reductions in crime, the main beneficiaries of which have been the residents of high crime neighborhoods, most of whom are people of color. I want to continue pushing back, though. Um, clearly, there is a problem here in terms of perception and belief in minority communities about the extent to which they can rely on the police to be their uh, public servants and protectors. Whatever the objective facts of the case might be, many of the people in these communities, it would appear, correct me if you know this to be wrong, uh, think 
that the police are the enemy, like that young man who didn't want to tell you his name, even though he had been shot and you needed that information to find out who shot him. So and even I don't know if he thought I was the enemy, to be honest. I just think he thought he could handle the situation better than I could. And for all I know, he was right. OK. Uh, but in any case, where I'm going with this is. Aren't the police uh, understood as a bureaucracy uh, and their political overlords ultimately responsible for the extent to which public have confidence in police behavior? Uh, the Justice Department produced two reports out of Ferguson. One of them seemed to exonerate Darren Wilson. But the other definitely uh, indicted uh, policing practices in Ferguson and environs for being insensitive to, or worse, uh, the uh, sensibilities of the African-American community. Could so many people who hate the cops be wrong? Are they merely irrational and emotionally responding to a situation, even if it's contrary to their interest? Or do they have good reasons not to trust the police, reasons that have to do ultimately with the way the police have conducted themselves in these communities? Look, as much as those beliefs are heartfelt, as much as they're based on their experience, absolutely um, they have that. And I think a lot of the onus there does fall on police. Um, as I mentioned before, there, there's no reason that non-criminals should hate the police. So some of that falls on police. Um, a lot of that falls on police. Um, okay. Police incivility and rudeness, I actually think, are, are major issues um, that to some extent go beyond the, the more publicized lethal use of force, which... which um, you know, luckily don't affect that many people. Um, but a rude cop can do a lot of harm. Um, but in as much as the narrative is based on lies, is based on things that simply aren't true, um, then you got to correct those facts. You know, once, once, the, once the facts change, you got to change your opinions a bit. Um, and certainly Michael Brown um, provides an example of that. I mean, yeah, yeah there, there's still issues with the Ferguson Police Department, but he was not an innocent man who was assassinated with his hands up. Um, to me, those facts matter. Um, and I would hope they matter to other people. Um, but yeah, I think police do have to make a little bit of the effort to just, you know, don't be a dick so much. Um, you know, it's, the cops sometimes lack the social skills. Sometimes it's the job that wears them down. And, and sometimes it's a lack of empathy. Um, you put all those together and it's, you know, people complain about DMV workers too, but they don't have the power of arrest. And, you know, <laughs> there, there's a, cops have a lot more power, um, to do harm if, if, um, if they're not policing well. But all okay. that said, yep. I mean, and I do think there are issues there. It does, I, and again, from the police perspective, um, you still have the vast majority of cops who are doing the right thing. Um, and, you know, I, I don't quite know how to convince people about that, you know, but other than saying I was a cop and that's what I saw. I got to uh, ask, who, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm cutting you off only because our time is short and there's so much I want to ask you about. What do you think of Al Sharpton? You're there working in New York City. Al Sharpton, president's point man in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, the first guy to call if you're the victim of your family is the victim of some police offense and you want press attention and so forth. Al Sharpton, uh, you know, liberal uh, icon, leader and so forth. Uh, what, what do you think about the role he's played in this uh, national dialogue? Look, I think Al Sharpton's a media chaser. I think he's a... I think he's in it for himself primarily. Um, but I'm going to say something that might surprise some of you. I think he's been good for policing. Um, I think the <laughs> NYPD shoots very few people in part because of Al Sharpton, um, because he brought attention to problems that perhaps needed attention brought, brought to. Um, also, his early days in New York, um, he did some good things for, for civil rights in New York City, um, pointing out neighborhoods where blacks still were not safe, you know, wasn't safe for blacks to walk down the street. Um, so I don't want to take that away from him. Um, and I don't defend his history, his character, um, or even his motives. Um, but I think he's made policing better. Um, you don't have to agree with someone or like someone to say that, okay, you know, this is part of our democratic society. Um, New York is combined, it's the center of media attention. You've got Al Sharpton. Um, but that also, if you want to press me more on that, you're free to. But that also brings me to another point, that so much of the criticism happens to the NYPD um, through Eric Garner and through others. Um, the NYPD um, kills far fewer people than other cities. Uh, for any big city department, it's the lowest by far. So perhaps when people aren't, you know, busy protesting bad shootings, and look, if there's a bad shooting, go ahead and protest. Um, but we should be looking at best practices. They're doing something right here in New York City. Um, there's no reason I can think of, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I, I've blogged about this at um, copinthehood.com, uh, where 
California has, you know, a rate, I don't want to get the numbers wrong, but we're, we're talking 10, 20 times higher than you find in states like New York or, or, or New Jersey. Uh, uh, the police New York City killing? Police Department in particular. Um, I'm sorry, Peter. Out. Excuse yeah. me, Peter. I just want to make sure I know what you're talking about. Uh, that's police killings that you're comparing uh, California yeah, to? Yeah, how many people yeah. per capita cops shoot? The odds yeah. of you being killed by a cop in Albuquerque or the entire um, state of Oklahoma yeah. are, are many times higher than you would get in, in, in other states like Michigan, New York, or New Jersey. But then if you break that down even further, the NYPD, um, it just, by American standard, it, it doesn't shoot very many people. Um, so I would look at that and say, well, they must be doing something right. What can we learn from this? Okay. Why is the rate in California something, you know, six times higher than New York? Though I don't know if that number is correct. Right. Um, but instead we're focused on individual incidents, and then we're not making any progress. Another question. What do you think about this fellow Lynch, who's the head of the Patrolman's uh, Union in uh, New York City? and who's been very vocal in criticizing Mayor de Blasio and speaking up on behalf of his guys. I think he's, um, I'm not a fan of his. Um, I don't know the guy. I don't want to criticize him too much here and what will be public. Um, I don't think he's, he's, um, I think he speaks for a lot of cops. I don't even know if it's the majority, uh, though he was just recently re reelected, but he represents a certain old school, um, uh, old school style of policing, a certain white uh, police officer. Um, and he, but um, I don't think he's helping the cause of policing right now. So That's my there, main issue. The, there's a racial element. I just want to get clear on this. I mean, there certainly is a racial element in the advocacy of some citizens, Al Sharpton included, against police brutality and on behalf of the victims thereof. Is there a racial element in some of the cops' reluctance to uh, embrace the leadership of Mayor Bill de Blasio or their... Uh, you know, uh, distaste Cop for the criticism that they've been receiving? Yeah, cops hate de Blasio because he's liberal. Um, I mean, people may not appreciate just how conservative police officers are in general. There are exceptions. Um, now, black police officers are more likely to vote democratically, though they can be very socially conservative. Um, but I, of course, have no idea how many white um, New York City cops voted for Obama. But they're, you know probably 20,000 or so uh, cops that fit that category. And I, I think you might, you'd be hard pressed to find a dozen. Um, it's a very conservative group. Um, <laughs> so they were never going to like de Blasio. But then de Blasio, you know, when he put Al Sharpton on the same stage as the police commissioner, um, that was a political error. Yeah. Um, and so he's, he's never going to win the cops back. But let's, but you know, had he played his cards right, you know, perhaps only 70% of cops would hate him as opposed to I would guess 80 or 90% today. <laughs> I see. Okay, uh, listen, author of Cop in the Hood, what did you learn? I'm sorry to ask such a simplistic question. I know it's an oversimplified gloss. But if you could tell me what was the most important thing you learned from the time that you spent on the ground policing New York City, as a uh, Baltimore City, as a regular police officer, what would it be? I actually think that's a great question. Sometimes the simple questions are the good ones. Uh, I would say I learned a few important things. Um, both my parents were teachers. My mother was a high school teacher, my father a professor. Um, I, um, I learned a certain amount of empathy for the working class. I simply did not have experience in the working class culture of, of policing. Um, I did not know any white pickup truck driving, God-fearing, hunting Republicans until I joined the Baltimore Police Department. Um, and today, and you know, the, though our political differences are great, I'm still friends with many of these people. Um, so that, that, that was a new culture for me. In terms of the area I policed, um, I think I was, I was shocked at, at, at the abject poverty and the violence, um, the shootings that happen every day. I have been to third world shanty towns, um, and I would prefer to grow up in a, in, in, in a shanty town outside Mexico City or outside Ni or in Nairobi um, than I would as, wow. as a, in East or West Baltimore, to be perfectly honest. It's, it's a complete yeah, breakdown of family structure. Not in the entire neighborhood. The problem is, anytime you mention these problems, I know people will complain that I'm, I'm, I'm making generalizations about a group. And I'm, I'm yes. not. Um, yes. But with that disclaimer, there is a problem of some people growing up right now in Baltimore um, without functional parents. Um, and statistically, these kids are going to end up dead or in, in prison. Um, that, that, that level of I mean, you know, I, I, when I'd arrested juveniles, sort of, you're stuck with them for a while. Um, 
And I'd say, you know, have you ever been out of Baltimore? No. A lot of them had never been really, maybe they went to the West Side once to visit their auntie or something, but they really, their entire lives were four blocks and not a very nice four blocks at that. And then you take them home and they go, man, God, if this was my home, I'd be out slinging too, anything but here. Um, that is, we as Americans, now, I don't know what the problem is, you know, to say, well, they're bad parents, you get accused of blaming the victim. And, and there may be some truth to that. But at some point, you got to call things out and say, look, we're not investing economically in these communities. These kids do not have options. They don't have families uh, that are being supportive and functional. Um, we're supposed to be a country that, you know, cares. Um, and I don't see that. Um, and that, you know, for all the people protesting police, and look, some of the people protesting police are from these neighborhoods, so I, I'm not talking about them, but for all the ones who don't, care about the people who live in those neighborhoods. Um, because believe it or not, um, at least when they start the job, cops care about them too. Um, and we as America just have failed. Um, and that's something, you know, to see that firsthand, I would say that that's the single most uh, lasting impact um, policing had on me. It wasn't, what affected me wasn't the, the gore and the death necessarily. That, that didn't bother me. It was just, it, it was seeing the living, living conditions of, of Americans and then, and then blaming them later when they don't succeed. You know, if, it, if, if your environment doesn't matter, then why don't you move there? Houses are cheap. Of course it matters where you grow up. Um, Good. My, my, my sort of, simple, to summarize that, one of my sort of pat answers, though, is, um, is yeah, conservatives too often don't give it a damn and liberals won't talk about culture. Um, you know, whatever the problem is, we're going to have to address culture. We're also going to have to spend money and we're also going to have to care. And, and, and we can't get any sort of political unity on that. Um, but uh, all, that, all that does go beyond policing. <laughs> That's spoken like a student of my good friend Orlando Patterson, which I know you are. Patterson, the sociologist at Harvard, who has been for decades saying culture matters and that liberals shouldn't be, a, 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 among whom I'm sure he would include himself, shouldn't be afraid to acknowledge the reality of culture and the debilitating effect that a flawed culture can have on holding back people, people of color in neighborhoods like the Baltimore communities that you policed. Uh, because it deprives them of the environment in which human beings are nurtured and in which they develop their best uh, talents and possibilities. So, Professor Patterson could not have said it better himself. Um, yeah, we we can't let conservatives. Um, well, I say we. I don't know if I should include you as a as a liberal. Um, we can't let <laughs> conservatives co op culture. Um, you know, this is something we got to talk about. I don't know why yeah. we're sort of on the liberal side. Um, academia has been so willing to to give it up. Okay, let me ask you something else, uh, Peter. And, and if you don't want to answer or discuss this, no problem. Uh, the last time I saw you was in San Francisco at the American Sociological Association meetings. Uh, I was there in order to participate in a panel on Alice Goffman's book, Alice Goffman, the Young Sociologist, University of Wisconsin. Uh, and the book is called On the Run, and it's about policing and uh, the evasion of uh, being arrested by the police of uh, um, young men of color in a Philadelphia neighborhood. And the book has come in for fierce criticism and controversy. I'm sure you've read these stories in the newspapers and uh, the websites about Alice Goffman's uh, involvement with a group of young men in Philadelphia who were engaged in criminal activity, perhaps her uh, behavior that might have abetted some criminal activity. So it has been speculated. Questions have been raised about the authenticity of her account. Questions have been raised about how a young white woman could become a legitimate voice to communicate the feelings and uh, thoughts and fears of the black men who lived in that community and so forth and so on. You're familiar with all these questions. I recount them only for our audience's benefit. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking your comment on that as a sociologist and uh, as the child of a famous sociologist, as is Alice Goffman. I thought it would be particularly interesting to hear your take if you'd care to share it with us. Um, yeah, look, um, I think what's being lost in the recent, you know, they say any publicity is good as long as it, they spell your name right. So I, I, I mean, <laughs> I know and like Alice, so I wish her the best. Um, Me I too. Find it abs I, I find it absurd, absurd that I don't think she made this up. Why would you have to? It's like making stuff. There's so much good reality. She was there for years. Right. Um, you, you simply don't have to make stuff up. Um, and the same goes for police research too. Um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you leave out. Uh, for whatever reason. Um, as to her being a white woman, giving other people voice, it is what it is. I mean, you know, that's, um, who was I as a, as a liberal Harvard student to give police officers voice, but that's what I try, you know, but that's what I did. Um, 
Right. You can't criticize her for who she is. You can criticize her for what she's done. And look, I have quibbles with the book, um, but no, none of those quibbles uh, compare to how great the book is and what she did do. I mean, um, her Good. the fact that she sort of almost, well, look, she did not abet a murder, just, you know, but the fact that she put herself in a situation where she could have abetted a murder. Yes. Um, okay, that doesn't distract from the book. I mean, she brought, she didn't have to mention that. I don't, yeah, I mean, we, we've all been in situations um, where things could have gone horribly wrong. Um, and sometimes they have gone horribly wrong. Um, okay, so she was in that situation. People yeah. shit. Excuse I mean, me for you know, hopefully she learned from it. I think she did. Uh, it certainly doesn't distract from the book. Um, yeah. As, as to the event, look, I mean, I think the book was too anti-police, quite frankly. But yeah. she's reflecting her reality. From the, but uh, this is what you're talking about before. Dude. Like, I don't think everything she said about police is true because I didn't see that as a cop, though I also wasn't a cop in Philadelphia. Um, but that certainly was seen as true among the people that she's with. And so there's this, you know, this is the Rashomon effect to some extent, but there's not a single truth out there. And I think absolutely she presents a truth that needs to be told. And if someone else wants to tell it, great. Um, and if you don't want to read the book because she's a white girl, well, don't read it. But um, it's a great book. Um, and, and she, you know, it's, it's, it's from its original research. It's daring research. Um, so, yeah, I, she should be applauded for all that. Okay, good. Uh, let me just add for uh, the benefit of people who might not know. Uh, this book is a report about the lives of young men, mainly in inner city Philadelphia, who are evading being arrested for warrants. They are therefore on the run. And it's the product of, I don't know, eight years or something like that of deeply embedded uh, observation and uh, research on Alice Goffman's part, who as an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania took up residence in uh, an inner city community and befriended people living there and observed the nature of their lives, their travails and struggles, and their interactions with the cops, and continued on through her PhD studies at Princeton as she was getting a sociology degree to uh, uh, live in this community and observe the things that are going on there, and has produced this narrative on the run, which recounts her experiences and uh, offers her views uh, about the situation. And it is a primary source of our knowledge now uh, you, I think, correctly characterize this as a magnificent piece of scholarship uh, about what goes on in these communities. And we don't have any other way of knowing but, yeah. but for people that's, to that's, get that's, their hands if, dirty if doing we, that. If we had an overload of, of, of books describing this, you know, then, then, I, then some of the criticisms yeah. I think would have more validity. But good right. God, I mean, look at what she's done. Look at what exactly. she's produced. It's great. The one thing I wish, and this hasn't been done in ethnography, I wish... Um, I was doing. I, I wish I was. A, I wish I'd been a cop at the same time she was doing her research. Um, and that would be great to have both sides of that equation. But of course, life gets in the way of that. Well, we're certainly benefiting from getting your side on this. And I got to ask you. We're running out of time here. One more thing, uh, Peter. And thank you so much for the time that you've given. You've written a book called "In Defense of Flogging." Okay, mm -hmm. flogging, flogging, corporal punishment, flogging. Peter, I want you to defend... I happen to have all my books within arm's reach. That perhaps <laughs> doesn't say much about me, but it's this book here. Much publicized, little bought. Uh, I just want you to defend your defense of flogging, man. What could possibly be a case for flogging people? That's barbaric. That's medieval. Peter. It sure is. The gambit of the book, look, really is trying to do is write a prison abolition book um, and, a, and not preach to the choir. Um, okay. The gambit is if you're convicted of a crime, doesn't matter if you did it or not, you're convicted of a crime... And the judge says, I'm going to sentence you to five years in prison or, um, or give you 10 Singapore-style lashes. Which would you pick? I'd take the lashes. Yeah, pretty much everyone would. But, yeah. so what does that, but we don't lash people because it's cruel and barbaric and inhumane, which it is. So what does that say about prison? It's worse. So how did we get to this system where we lock up 2.3 million Americans? More than, we have more prisoners than China. They got a billion more people than we do. Um, this, to me, is a moral issue of our era. Um, history will not judge us kindly for this. That we oh. accepted this as normal. So, but here's the thing. If we're going to reduce, if we're going to bring back our incarceration levels to the civilized world, um, to what America had until the war on drugs, yep. um, we'd have to release 80% of our prisoners. Yep. Um, we need to rethink punishment. Um, unlike some liberals, I am not willing, I, I believe in punishment, but proportional. 
humane. Um, and I don't think flogging's good. I think it's better. I think it really, it shines the light on how bad prison is. Um, and if you've got a third way, I'm all ears. Um, but we basically need to, we need anything but prison. And I think presenting it in sort of that flogging um, context, I'm trying to make a, a stark, um, trying to, you know, I'm trying to bring it to, to people's attention. Um, in many, you know, the book, ironically, that I didn't want to write, um, I didn't want to write an anti-prison book. Um, the book, my, In Defense of Flogging, is quite similar to The New Jim Crow, um, though In Defense of Flogging is shorter, and, and I in my <laughs> honestly, think it's a better read. Uh, but the point is very similar. Um, but I wanted my book to sell, and I didn't want to write a book like that. Of course, hers became a bestseller, and mine was got a lot of press, but didn't sell, so um, maybe I should just preach to the choir next time. Um, but I, I wanted to cross over into the conservative world, which didn't really happen with the book. Mother Jones loved it. Um, I never got on Rush Limbaugh, but, um, you know... <laughs> I don't have to tell liberals that our criminal justice system is messed up. We, we, we need to change the prison system. We, we need to appeal to political conservatives. Um, I don't think I accomplished that, but I, I got, at least I got some people talking about prison who otherwise um, wouldn't know just what an evil system it is. Okay, and, it's, and it's an evil system by design. It's not like we evolved into this. But yeah. anyway, that's why people should read the book. It's, 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 it's short okay. and inexpensive. I'm definitely recommending reading the book. So the tongue is a little bit in the cheek there, is it, when we defend flogging? Because what we're really doing is attacking the way in which we punish, to which flogging would be a, a, a favor, it would be a desirable alternative. Not that you're advocating flogging, but you're definitely criticizing what we do. The book is primarily a criticism of prison. Um, it's not it's not tongue in cheek though. I mean, I do think we should give prisoners the option of being flogged to stay out of prison. Um, it's weird that we would choose it for ourselves, but then not give them the choice. Um, it's only with the consent of the flog. Um, but it was in the course of writing the book and researching the book that um, originally, when my editor proposed uh, I write a book with that title, I said, "Can we at least put a question mark on it?" He's like, "No." Um, <laughs> so I mean, yeah, I, I defend flogging literally as the lesser of two evils. Um, but my goal is to get you to see prison as evil, and then let's start talking about what we're going to do about it. Um, and look, we, we could do something about it. We have so many prisoners not because of crime. We have prisoners because our sentences are too long, uh, because of the war on drugs. These are political choices we make. Indeed. Um, the problem is once people go into a prison for a long time, and this is why it's worse than flogging, um, you, you, a lot of people really become damaged goods. One of the sad things about writing the book is just hearing from people who wanted me to help in ways I couldn't help saying, you know, my cousin, my brother, my son um, went to prison for some, usually a drug crime, but it didn't matter what it was. And they just said, you know, they, they came out and, they're, and, they're, and they're, they've never been the same. Indeed. Um, and this happens to, to literally, you know, millions of Americans. Indeed. No, I've been on this hobby horse myself for a while. I mean, to survive in prison, you have to adopt patterns of behavior which affect you. And those patterns are reproduced when you come out and they affect the tenor of life in the community to which you return. And the wall between the prison and the community becomes porous. And the net effect of that on the on life in those communities is definitely not good. No, sir, it's not. So what are we going to do about it? I mean, uh, I wrote a book. That That's what I, right? I mean, that's what I did. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, that's a topic for another conversation, Peter. What are we going to do about it? I think that's a fit topic for another conversation. Hey, I also wrote Greek Americans. You're, you know, all the Greeks will like that one. But we don't need to get into that one right now. <laughs> well, we've already done. All right, that's In Defense of Flogging. That's Cop in the Hood. And that's uh, Greek Americans, all by Peter Moskos, professor at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Peter, thanks so much for coming on The Glenn Show. Oh, it's so good to have a real conversation about something as opposed to just sound bites. Very good. Take care of yourself. And again, I really appreciate your time. Anytime. Take care.